Slit lamp by microscopy is an acquired skill. This introduction will help you over the initial hurdles that all face when confronted with their first patient at the slit lamp. The purpose of this video is to acquaint you with all the features and uses of slit lamp by microscopy. With this information, you can begin concentrating on what you're seeing rather than thinking about the mechanics of the examination. As Yogi Berra says, you can see a lot just by observing. Slit lamp by microscopy has four advantages over loop observations. Better magnification, improved stereopsis, superior illumination, and excellent depth localization. The slit lamp produces a very bright and focused beam of light that can be varied from a hairline slit to an eight millimeter wide beam or to a small spot beam of light. The light source is coupled by a common carriage to a binocular microscope observation system. Both light and magnifier are parfocal, that is, focused at the exact same place. Therefore, when the slit beam is seen in sharp focus, the object on which it is focused will be clearly seen through the oculars. Fine manipulations of the slit beam can then aid in evaluating an area of interest or abnormality, such as this corneal scar. The slit beam can pivot independently side to side through 180 degrees to permit viewing of any ocular structure from different angles, particularly helpful in depth localization. The basic slit lamp by microscopy exam procedure is as follows. One, adjust the headrest and height of the chin rest for the patient's maximum comfort and proper viewing level. The patient's eye should be level with the black line on the headrest column. This indicates there will be equal vertical maneuvering room above and below this line. Two, set the eyepieces at zero or for your refractive error and adjust the interpupillary distance of the oculars. Three, turn on the power to the slit lamp. Four, release the fixing screw that locks the base or cross slide. Five, grasp the base carriage or cross slide with both hands and move it so the slit beam is focused on the patient's temporal or lateral conjunctiva. This is done with the naked eye and not by looking through the oculars. Now look through the microscope and find focus the slit beam by maneuvering the joystick. Note that the light beam can be elevated or lowered by twisting or rotating the joystick. To vary the dimensions of the light, the following controls must be adjusted. Slit beam length is manipulated by turning the upper control lever knob. The lever also controls slit beam orientation or rotation. Slit beam width is controlled by turning the lower control knobs. Beam intensity and color are controlled by the transformer output and upper filter lever. Increasing the voltage from the standard five to seven and a half volts will double the lamp brightness, but it'll also significantly shorten the life of the lamp. Almost all examinations can be easily and effectively carried out with a transformer output set at five volts. The filter lever provides five positions. One in five are open, that is no filter. Two is a heat absorption filter used with the lamp overloaded to seven and a half volts with a fully open slit beam. Three is a 10% gray filter used with fundus and especially macular biomicroscopy. Four is the red free or green filter for enhanced contrast in viewing red objects. Note, the blue filter for tonometry is located by manipulating the upper control lever knob. In review, for most slit lamp exams, you will use the power at five volts, no filters, 10x magnification, a narrow slit beam, and the slit illuminator swung from side to side at an angle of approximately 35 to 45 degrees from the microscope. It is the fine adjustments of the angle of the lamp arm and the joystick that reveal the subtle details. Slit lamp by microscopy is a dynamic exam. Now that you know how to focus the slit beam on the eye, you need to engage the cooperation of your patient. The patient must fixate or look at some convenient target to keep their eye steady. Your ear makes a good target. 
This is essential when you must study a particular structure in detail. Start your examination with low power magnification so you don't miss the forest for the trees. Higher magnification can be used when there is a particular area of interest requiring further study. The magnification can be increased two ways on the Hogstrite slit lamp. The easier way is by moving the objective lever on the microscope from the left to the right. This increases the magnification from 10 to 16x. The second and more cumbersome method of increasing the magnification requires exchanging the 10 power eyepieces for the 16 power ones, thereby increasing the magnification from 16x to 25x. A newer model, Hogstrite, has knobs on either side of the microscope body, coupled to five variable optical elements that produce five different magnifications. Remember, higher magnification usually only makes what you don't know bigger. Develop a systematic examination method so important areas of the external eye and anterior segment are not overlooked. Learn to use both hands for ease and comfort in manipulations around the eye. Start by examining the extraocular structures. Look at the lids and lashes. Have the patient look up and then down while you hold the eyelids with a Q-tip so that the bulbar conjunctiva, normally covered by the lids, can be adequately inspected. Learn to avert the upper and lower lids for access to the tarsal conjunctiva. Next, direct the light to the interpalpebral bulbar conjunctiva to evaluate this area. Begin your anterior segment examination by sweeping the narrow slit beam across the cornea while looking at its various layers and their reflections. The slit lamp is particularly well suited for studying the details of the cornea, anterior chamber, iris, and lens. Certain slit lamp manipulations make anterior segment examinations much more revealing and rewarding. Varying the angle and width of the slit beam are necessary to obtain the most from your examination. For example, the depth of a corneal lesion is best judged by using a fine hairline slit beam and a 35 to 45 degree angle between the illuminating beam and microscope. A broad light beam is more suited for determining the size and overall shape of surface abnormalities, such as this iris nevus. A small, bright spot beam of light angled in front of the dark pupil will reveal cells and flare in the aqueous in cases of anterior uveitis. This is called the Tyndall phenomenon. Remember, varying the angle between the microscope and slit illumination will enhance your observations. A wide angle between the light and microscope will produce an easily viewed optical section of transparent structures and will also highlight the texture of the iris. A small angle or coaxial position of the light will promote examining the details of clear structure by retroilluminating them. The following are six different methods of illumination used in slit lamp by microscopy that will bring out all the details and features of the anterior segment of the eye. Included are some patient examples demonstrating each illumination maneuver. First, diffuse illumination. This uses a broad light beam that provides a panoramic view, like using a flashlight. It is good for outlining large surface areas such as a corneal abrasion. 2. Direct or focal illumination. This makes use of the hairline slit beam. The microscope and slit beam are directly in focus on the object being examined. This is particularly suited to depth localization and shows that this corneal abrasion is very superficial. 3. Indirect proximal illumination. This maneuver highlights the object being evaluated at the side of the light beam not directly where the light is focused, such as these KP or keratitic precipitates. Four, retroillumination produces two types of illumination. First, direct retroillumination, which reveals details in the reflected light, such as this small corneal foreign body rust ring. And secondly, indirect retroillumination, which reveals the details just off the path of the reflected light 
as shown by this Krukenberg pigment spindle on the corneal endothelium. Fifth, specular reflection. This reveals details that are seen when the reflected light is viewed at the same angle from the perpendicular as the angle of incidence of the slit beam light. This type of illumination is ideal for examining the corneal endothelium. Sixth and last, sclerotic scatter. This uses a light source that is decentered and defocused, that is no longer part focal with a microscope. The slit beam is aimed at the limbus or the edge of the cornea, while the microscope is focused on the cornea. This maneuver is very useful in picking up fine abnormalities of the cornea, such as these corneal infiltrates. To perform sclerotic scatter, you must loosen the centering screw found at the back, lower portion of the slit lamp arm. Then the slit beam can be pivoted off its vertical axis to defocus the light from the microscope. Remember, you must tighten this knob at the completion of your sclerotic scatter examination or all subsequent exams will be out of focus. In summary, there are six types of slit lamp illumination that can make your biomicroscopy of the anterior segment more revealing and rewarding. Diffuse, focal, proximal, direct and indirect retroillumination, specular reflection, and finally sclerotic scatter. It is the fine adjustments of the angle of the lamp arm and the joystick that reveal the subtle details. Slit lamp by microscopy is a dynamic exam. You should also become familiar with the different arrangements for the controls on the Zeiss 30 SL slit lamp. The transformer on off switch is located under the platform. However, to vary the illumination intensity, the right hand knob just in front of the joystick must be rotated. A slightly smaller knob on the left and in front of the joystick is the friction lock for the base. The microscope magnification changer knobs are found on both sides of the microscope body. Turning this knob can change the magnification in five steps from 5 to 30x. Manipulation of the slit beam is accomplished by adjusting one or all three knobs vertically arranged on both sides of the slit illuminator housing. The medium-sized upper knob controls slit beam orientation or rotation. The largest knob, in the middle, adjusts the slit beam width, and the lower smallest knob controls slit beam height. All filters are located at the back top portion of the slit illuminator housing. The filters for tonometry and red-free observation are in the upper knurled ring, coded with colored lines. The lower knurled ring, color-coded with multiple white lines, holds three filters that attenuate the light by 10, 20, and 40 percent. The lever on the upper right-hand side of the slit illuminator housing decenters the slit for sclerotic scatter illumination evaluations. The remaining two knobs found in front of the slit illuminator body control the swivel and angle between the illuminator and microscope. Applination tonometry should be performed after the anterior segment examination. Place the tonometer in position Insert the blue filter in the slit beam path. Anesthetize the eyes and instill fluorescein. Then gently move the slit lamp carriage with both hands towards the eye. If the patient withdraws, have them look down and gently lift their eyelid and hold it against the brow. Guide the tonometer and slit lamp carriage with your free hand to almost touch the eye. At this point, have the patient look up at an appropriate target, such as your ear, as you advance the tonometer prism onto their eye. If the patient is not intimidated by the advancing tonometer tip, you can eliminate holding their upper eyelid. Adjust the pressure of the tonometer prism, cornea contact, with the joystick so that the Myers are symmetric. Next, adjust the tonometer's knurled knob to apply the needed force to produce the endpoint inner circle touching inner circle. 
The position of the measuring drum at the side of the tonometer knob records the units of force that are needed to flatten a known area of the cornea. These units are directly converted to millimeters of mercury. The normal range of intraocular pressure is from 10 to 21 millimeters of mercury. Gonioscopy, or the anterior chamber examination, can be easily and comfortably performed at the slit lamp. Evaluation of the angle is of particular importance in the workup of any glaucoma patient. A gonioscopy lens is required to change the dynamics of the index of refraction at the cornea-air interface. Otherwise, all light that enters the anterior chamber is reflected back into the eye. There are several varieties of gonio lens commonly used. The Zeiss or the Sussman four mirror lenses and the Goldman gonio prism or the Goldman three mirror lens. The four mirror lenses have a lens corneal contact surface that requires no additional fluid and all four quadrants of the anterior chamber angle can be evaluated without manipulating the lens. The Goldman lenses have only one gonio mirror and require that the lens be rotated on the eye to evaluate the entire 360 degrees of the angle. In addition, a viscous methylcellulose solution must be used as the optical interface between the Goldman contact lens and cornea to obtain a clear view. Remember to use a topical anesthetic before placing any gonio lens on the eye. For all gonioscopic exams, you must stabilize the lens by bracing your hand and fingers gently on the patient's cheek and forehead while your elbow rests comfortably on the table or an elbow support if your forearm is too short. To start, the light should be coaxially aligned with the microscope. Then, after focusing on the iris cornea angle, vary the slit orientation and the slit microscope angle to adequately examine the entire angle. In addition, the four mirror lenses can be gently pushed onto the eye to see if the anterior chamber angle will deepen. This maneuver is very helpful in determining whether a closed appearing anterior chamber angle can be opened. Both eyes should be evaluated and compared. The usual problems with learning gonioscopy are keeping adequate contact between the lens and cornea and two, creating folds that distort the view by pressing too hard. The slit lamp provides an excellent way of evaluating the posterior pole of the retina, that is the optic disc, macula, and major vessel arcades, with a magnified three-dimensional view. This can be accomplished by one of three methods. Ruby lens, 90 diopter indirect lens, or Goldman contact lens. These lenses are needed to neutralize the refractive power of the ocular media so the slit beam can be focused on the retina. The best exam is achieved with a dilated pupil. However, with practice, the 90 diopter lens can be used without pupillary dilation. Initially, the slit beam should be coaxial with the microscope for fundus biomicroscopy. The fellow eye must be steadily fixing on some target. This is the best time to use the fixation target coupled to the slit lamp. The 90 diopter lens exam starts with a coaxially aligned slit beam focused on the cornea. The 10% gray filter should be used to reduce the risk of light toxicity to the retina. Introduce the 90 diopter lens in the light path in front of the eye while bracing your hand on the patient's forehead. Slowly pull the joystick back and a slit fundus red reflex will come into focus. Maneuver the lens and slit lamp for the best view to reduce the reflections, and to evaluate various areas of the posterior pole in some peripheral retina. The 90 diopter lens produces an inverted and reversed image, just like indirect ophthalmoscopy. Its advantages are its wide field of view, avoidance of anesthetics and eye contact, and the general ease in using it. The inverted image and smaller magnification are considered by some to be its major faults. The ruby lens produces an upright image with about the same magnification as the direct ophthalmoscope. It requires a little more setup as the shank of the ruby lens must be inserted into the groove of the guide plate and the fixation light 
must be used for the fellow eye. The only way to observe different areas of the retina with the ruby lens is to have the fellow eye track your maneuvers of the fixation light. The initial slit lamp setup is the same as for the 90 diopter exam, except you interpose the ruby lens in the light path. The ruby lens is particularly good for detailed optic disc evaluations. The Goldman contact fundus lens is the premier lens for evaluation of the macula, and the three mirror lens is excellent for peripheral retina examinations. The Hogstrite slit beam can be inclined or tilted by depressing the latch at the base of the lamp arm. By tilting, rotating, and coaxially setting the slit beam to horizontal, and using the Goldman three mirror fundus lens, the peripheral vitreous and retina exam can be optimized. Utilizing the tilt feature with a horizontal slit beam can eliminate unwanted and interfering light reflections in all methods of fundus biomicroscopy. In conclusion, the dynamic use of the slit beam size, orientation, and its relative position with the microscope will produce the most information in your examinations. Careful slit lamp biomicroscopy will reward you with a great deal of valuable information, information that can be essential to the proper diagnosis and management of many ocular diseases. This introduction to slit lamp biomicroscopy should make your early efforts easier and more successful so that you may become more accomplished and provide better patient care. Thank you.